Hey everybody, it's good to have you back. I'm Pastor Dan from Riverside Assembly. I want to say hi to everybody who's been on this journey with us in the Chronicles of Narnia uh, by the great writer C.S. Lewis. All you visitors that are, are coming in and, and listening, I hope that you're enjoying the story. And you Riverside kids, I want you to know that I miss you so much uh, and can't wait to get to a time where we can come to church together and I can give you guys hugs and, uh, and see you again. But we're going to continue with chapter four of the, of the Prince, uh, excuse me, of Prince Caspian. If you remember at the end of chapter three, the children had found uh, uh, the dwarf who had, they'd been, were going to execute him. Uh, not the children, two soldiers were going to ex execute him. The children rescued him and he's about to tell them his story and the story of Prince Caspian. And this is the story. Chapter 4, The Dwarf Tells of Prince Caspian. Prince Caspian lived in a great castle in the center of Narnia, with his uncle Moraz, the king of Narnia, and his aunt, who had red hair and was called Queen Prunaprismia. His father and mother were dead, and the person whom Caspian loved best was his nurse, and though being a prince he had wonderful toys, which would do almost anything but talk, he liked best the last hour of the day when the toys had all been put back in their cupboards and the nurse would tell him stories. He did not care much for his uncle and aunt, but about twice a week his uncle would send for him and they would walk up and down together for half an hour on the terrace at the south side of the castle. One day while they were doing this, the king said to him, Well, boy, we must soon teach you to ride and use a sword. You know that your aunt and I have no children. So it looks as if you might have to be a king when I'm gone. How should you like that, eh? I don't know, uncle, said Caspian. Don't know, eh, said Moraz. Well, I should like to know what more anyone could wish for. All the same, I do wish, said Caspian. What do you wish, asked the king. I wish, I wish, I wish I could have lived in the old days, said Caspian. He was only a very little boy at the time. Up till now, King Moraz had been talking in that tiresome way that some grown-ups have, which makes it quite clear that they're not really interested in what they're saying. But now he suddenly gave Caspian a very sharp look. Eh, what's that? he said. What old days, you mean? Oh, don't you know, Uncle, said Caspian, when everything was quite different, when all the animals could talk and there were nice people who lived in the streams and the trees, naiads and dryads, they were called, and there were dwarfs? And there were lovely little fawns all in, in all the woods. They had feet like goats. And that's all nonsense for babies, said the king sternly. Only fit for babies, do you hear? Getting too old for that sort of stuff. At your age, you ought to be thinking of battles and adventures, not fairy tales. Ah, but there were battles and adventures in those days, said Caspian. Wonderful adventures. Once there was a white witch, and she made herself queen of the whole country. And she made it so that it was always winter. And then two boys and two girls came from somewhere, and so they killed the witch, and they were made kings and queens of Narnia, and their names were Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy. And they reigned for ever so long, and everyone had a lovely time, and it was all because of Aslan. Who's he? said Moraz. If Caspian had been a little older, the tone of his uncle's voice would have warned him that it would have been wiser to shut up. But he babbled on. Oh, don't you know, he said, Aslan is the great lion who comes from over the sea. Who has been telling you all this nonsense, said the king in a voice of thunder. Caspian was frightened and said nothing. Your royal highness, said King Moraz, letting go of Caspian's hand, which he had been holding till now. I insist upon being answered. Look me in the face. Who has been telling you this pack of lies? Nurse, faltered Caspian and burst into tears. Stop that noise, said his uncle, taking Caspian by the shoulders and giving him a shake. Stop it. Never let me catch you talking or thinking either about all those silly stories again. There were never those kings and queens. How could there be two kings at the same time? And there's no such person as Aslan. And there are no such things as lions. And there never was a time when animals could talk. Do you hear? Yes, uncle, sobbed Caspian. And let's have no more of it, said the king. Then he called for one of the gentlemen-in-waiting who were standing at the far end of the terrace and said in a cold voice, 
conduct his royal highness to his apartments and send his royal highness's nurse to me at once. The next day, Caspian found what a terrible thing he had done, for the nurse had been sent away without even being allowed to say goodbye to him, and he was told he was going to have a tutor. Caspian missed his nurse very much and shed many tears, and because he was so miserable, he thought about the old stories of Narnia before, far, before, far more than he did before. He dreamed of dwarfs and dryads every night and tried very hard to make the dogs and cats in the castle talk to him. But the dogs only wagged their tails and the cats only purred. Caspian felt sure he would hate the new tu tutor. But when the tutor arrived about a week later, he turned out to be the sort of person it's almost impossible not to like. He was the smallest and also the fattest man Caspian had ever seen. He had a long, silvery, pointed beard which came down to his waist, and his face, which was brown and covered with wrinkles, looked very wise, very ugly, and very kind. His voice was grave, and his eyes were so merry, so that until you got to know him really well, it was hard to know when he was joking and when he was serious. His name was Dr. Cornelius. Of all his lessons with Dr. Cornelius, the one that Caspian liked best was history. Up till now, except for Nurse's stories, he had known nothing about the history of Narnia, and he was very surprised to learn that the royal family were newcomers in the country. It was your highness's ancestor, Caspian I, said Dr. Cornelius, who first conquered Narnia and made it his kingdom, and it was he who brought all your nation into the country. You are not Narnians, not native Narnians at all. You are Telmarines, that is, you came from the land of Telmar, far beyond the western mountains. That is why Caspian I is called Caspian the Conqueror. Please, doctor, asked Caspian one day, who lived in Narnia before we all, we, we all came here out of Telmar? No men, or very few, lived in Narnia before the Telmarines took it, said Dr. Cornelius. Then who did my great-great-grandcestors conquer? Whom, not who, your highness, said Dr. Cornelius. But it is time to turn from history to grammar. Oh, please, not yet, said Caspian. I mean, I mean, wasn't there a battle? Why is he called Caspian the Conqueror if there was nobody here to fight with him? I said there were very few men in Narnia, said the doctor, looking at the little boy very strangely through his great spectacles. For a moment, Caspian was puzzled, and then suddenly his heart gave a leap. Do you mean, he gasped, that there were other things? Do you mean it was like in the stories where the... Hush, said Dr. Cornelius, laying his head very close to Caspian's. Not a word more. Don't you know that your nurse was sent away for telling you about old Narnia? The king doesn't like it. If he found me telling you secrets, you'd be whipped, and I should have my head cut off. But why, asked Caspian. It is high time we turned to grammar now, said Dr. Cornelius in a loud voice. Will your royal highness please open Pulverentus Siccus at the fourth page of his grammatical garden or the arbor of accidents pleasantly opened to tender wits? After that, it was all nouns and verbs till lunchtime, but I don't think Caspian learned much. He was too excited. He felt sure that Dr. Cornelius would not have said so much unless he meant to tell him more sooner or later. In this, he was not disappointed. A few days later, his tutor said, Tonight I am going to give you a lesson in astronomy. At dead of night, two noble planets, Tava and Elambil, will pass within one degree of each other. Such a conjunction has not occurred for 200 years, and your highness will not live to see it again. It will be best if you go to bed a little earlier than usual. When the time of the conjunction draws near, I will come and wake you. This didn't seem to have anything to do with old Narnia, which was what Caspian really wanted to hear about. But getting up in the middle of the night is always interesting, and he was moderately pleased. When he went to bed that night, he thought at first that he would not be able to sleep, but he soon dropped off, and it seemed only a few minutes before he felt someone gently shaking him. He sat up in bed and saw that the moon was full of moon the room was full of moonlight. Dr. Cornelius, muffled in a hooded robe and holding a small lamp in his hand, stood by the bedside. Caspian remembered at once what they were going to do. He got up and put on some clothes. Although it was a summer night, he felt colder than he had expected and was quite glad when 
Doctor, the doctor wrapped him in a robe like his own and gave him a pair of warm, soft buskins for his feet. A moment later, both muffled so that they could hardly be seen in the dark corridors, and both shod so that they hardly made any noise, master and pupil left the room. Caspian followed the doctor through many passages and up several staircases, and at last, through a little door in a turret, they came out upon the leads. On one side were the battlements, on the other a steep roof, below them all shadowy and shimmery the castle gardens, above them stars and moon. Presently they came to another door which led into the great central tower of the whole castle. Dr. Cornelius unlocked it and they began to climb the dark winding stair of the tower. Caspian, Caspian was becoming excited. He had never been allowed up this stair before. It was long and steep, but when they came out on the roof of the tower and Caspian had got his breath, he felt that it had all been worth it. Away on his right, he could see rather indistinctly the western mountains. On his left was the gleam of the great river, and everything was so quiet that he could hear the sound of the waterfall at Beaver's Dam a mile away. There was no difficulty in picking out the two stars that they had come to see. They hung rather low in the southern sky, almost bright as two little moons, and very close together. Are they going to have a collision? he asked in an awestruck voice. Nay, dear prince, said the doctor, and he too spoke in a whisper. The great lords of the upper sky know their step, the steps of their dance far too well for that. Look well upon them. Their meeting is fortunate and means some great good for the sad realm of Narnia. Tava, the Lord of Victory, salutes Alambil, the Lady of Peace. They are just coming to their nearest. Oh, it's a pity the trees get in the way, said Caspian. We'd really see better from the West Tower, though it's not so high. Dr. Cornelius said nothing for about two minutes, but stood still with his eyes fixed on Tarva and Alambil. Then he drew a deep breath and turned to Caspian. There, he said. You have seen what no man now alive has seen or will see again. And you are right. We should have seen it better from the smaller tower. I brought you here for another reason. Caspian looked up at him, but the doctor's hood concealed most of his face. The virtue of this tower, said Cornelius, is that we have six empty rooms beneath us, and a long stair, and the door at the bottom of the stairs locked. We cannot be overheard. Are you going to tell me what you wouldn't tell me the other day? said Caspian. I am, said the doctor. But remember, you and I must never talk about these things except here, on the very top of the great tower. No, that's a promise, said Caspian. But do go on, please. Listen, said the doctor. All you have learned about old Narnia is true. It is not the land of men. It is the country of Aslan and the country of the waking trees and visible naiads and fauns of satire, satyrs and dwarfs and giants, of the gods and the centaurs of talking beasts. It was against these that the first Caspian fought. It is you Telmarines who silenced the beasts and the trees and the fountains, and who killed and drove away the dwarfs and fauns, and are now trying to cover up even the memory of them. The king does not allow them to be spoken of. Oh, I do wish we hadn't, said Caspian, and I am glad it's all true, even if it is all over. Many of your race wish that in secret, said Dr. Cornelius. But doctor, said Caspian, why do you say my race? After all, I suppose you're a Telmarine too. Am I? said the doctor. Well, you're a man anyway, said Caspian. Am I? repeated the doctor in a deeper voice at the same moment throwing his head back so that Caspian could see his face clearly in the moonlight. All at once, Caspian realized the truth and felt that he ought to have realized it long before. Dr. Cornelius was so small and so fat and had such a very long beard. Two thoughts came into his head at the same moment. One was a thought of terror. He's not a real man, not a man at all. He's a dwarf and he's brought me up here to kill me. The other thought was sheer delight. There are real dwarfs still, and I've seen one at last. So you've guessed it in the end, said Dr. Cornelius. Or guessed it nearly right. I'm not a pure dwarf. I have human blood in me too. 
Many dwarfs escaped in the great battles and lived on, shaving their beards and wearing high-heeled shoes and pretending to be men. They have mixed with your tell marines. I am one of those, only a half-dwarf. And if any of my kindred, the true dwarfs, were still alive anywhere in the world, doubtless they would despise me and call me a traitor. But never in all these years have we forgotten our own people and all the other happy creatures of Narnia and the long-lost days of freedom. I'm, I'm sorry, Doctor, said Caspian. It wasn't my fault, you know. I'm not saying these things to, in blame of you, dear Prince, answered the Doctor. You may well ask why I say them at all, but I have two reasons. Firstly, because my old heart has carried these secret memories so long that it aches with them and would burst if I did not whisper them to you. But secondly, for this, that when you become king, you may help us, for I know that you also, tell Marine though you are, love the old things. I do, I do, said Caspian, but how can I help? You can be kind to the poor remnants of the dwarf people, like myself. You can gather learned magicians and try to find a way of awakening the trees once more. You can search through all the nooks and wild places of the land to see if any fawns or talking beasts or dwarfs are perhaps still alive and hiding. Do you think there are any? asked Caspian eagerly. I don't know. I don't know, said the doctor with a deep sigh. Sometimes I'm afraid there can't be. I've been looking for traces of them all my life. Sometimes I have thought I heard a dwarf drum in the mountains. Sometimes at night in the woods I thought I had caught a glimpse of fawns and satyrs dancing a long way off, but when I came to the place there was never anything there. I have often despaired, but something always happens to stop me hoping again. I don't know, but at least you can try to be a king like the High King Peter of old, and not like your uncle. Then it's true about the kings and queens, too, and about the White Witch, said Caspian. Certainly it's true, said Cornelius. Their reign was the golden age in Narnia, and the land was never forgotten, and the land has never forgotten them. Did they live in this castle, Doctor? Nay, my dear, said the old man. This castle is a thing of yesterday. Your great-great-grandfather built it. But when the two sons of Adam and the two daughters of Eve were made kings and queens of Narnia by Aslan himself, they lived in the castle of Ker Paravel. No man alive has seen that blessed place, and perhaps even the ruins of it have now vanished. But we believe it was far from here, down at the mouth of the great river, on the very shore of the sea. Oh, said Caspian with a shudder. Do you mean in the black woods where all the, the you know, the ghosts live? Your Highness speaks as you have been taught, said the doctor. But it is all lies. There are no ghosts there. That is a story invented by the Telmarines. Your kings are in deadly fear of the sea because they can never quite forget that in all the stories Aslan comes from over the sea. They don't want to go near it. And they don't want anyone else to go near it. So they have left the great woods grow they have left the great woods to grow up and cut their people off from the coast. But because they have quarreled with the trees, they are afraid of the woods. And because they are afraid of the woods, they imagine that they are full of ghosts. And the kings and great men, hating both the sea and the wood, partly believe these stories and partly encourage them. They feel safer if no one in Narnia dares to go down to the coast and look out to the sea towards Aslan's land in the morning and the eastern end of the world. There was a deep silence between them for a few minutes. Then Dr. Cornelius said, Come, we have been here long enough. It is time to go down and to bed. Oh, must we, said Caspian. I'd like to go on talking about these things for hours and hours and hours. Someone might begin looking for us if we did that, said Dr. Cornelius. So we've learned the first part of the story of Prince Caspian. And we'll continue with his story next time when we read chapter five. Once again, sorry about... The sound not being as good as it has been, but we're going to try to fix that hopefully by next week. But God bless you. Thanks for, living, uh, for listening, and we'll see you real soon, hopefully. Bye-bye.